Vishnupadaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Deve Ghoravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vancha kaupa tarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhayevacha patitanam pavane bhyo vaishnavi bhyo namo namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadhadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're studying Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, and we're on the appearance of Chitra Ketu and his uh, pastimes, or the events which took place with Chitraketu and how he got the mercy of Narada and Angira, described in Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, uh, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, right? Today we're on chapter number, what is it? 16, I think. Anyway, this is Bhakti Vaibhav. So, let me see. I should have a text. <clears throat> yeah, chapter 15. Okay, chapter 15, the saints Narada and Angira instructing King Chitraketu. Let's have a little review what happened in chapter 14. We heard about Maharaj Chitraketu, how he had uh, millions of wives who were all barren, unfortunately, and he desperately wanted to have a son. He desperately wanted a son because the son was so important to deliver not only him but all the forefathers, all the forefathers in the dynasty. They needed the son to offer oblations, to offer Pinda for their benefit. So Maharaj Chitraketu had married many wives but didn't get a son and he greatly lamented. Anyway, we heard it was described about his uh, wonderful qualities as a king. He kept everybody happy and uh, he controlled his mind and he was not running the country in an absolute manner. He was willing to hear from others. He worked in dependence on the cooperation of the brahmanas and in good contact with the brahmana society, the ministers and his government and so on. So everybody in the kingdom was happy, he was the ideal leader and the country was very prosperous but the only problem was that he had no son. And so it happened that Angira had come there and Angira had asked about the kingdom and Angira had also noticed the facio appearance of Maharaj Chitraketu, he could see that he was not perfectly happy and peaceful and he inquired from, Angira, uh, from Chitraketu Maharaj what was the problem and Chitraketu told him how much he wanted the son 
So Angira benedicted him, gave the he did some he had some yagya done by Twasta, and the sweet rice was given to the number one wife of Chitraketu, and so she conceived a child, and the child was born. But after the child was born, Maharaj Chitraketu neglected the other wives. And he only devoted himself to the child and to the first wife who had delivered his son. So all the other wives felt neglected and they con contrived the plan to give the child poison. And they ended up killing the child by giving the child poison. And when the child died, then Maharaj Chitraketu and his wife, they both lamented greatly. And we heard about the lamentation, how, how they lamented, that, they, uh, that Maharaj Chitraketu's wife was saying, what kind of justice is this where the child has to die before the father? The, usually the law of nature is that the, the oldest person will meet death before the young one. But the young child died, so the, the queen thought this is really not proper, this is not just providence, it's cruel to us, why should it be like this? Hmm, like this, they were lamenting and greatly in separation. So it was at this time that Angira appears along with Narada Muni understanding the situation because Angira had already warned that this child will bring you happiness but he will also be the cause of lamentation. Just like we say a coin has two sides, there's the head and the tail. And so along with happiness there comes also distress. So Maharaj Chitraketu didn't worry about it very much. He thought, oh, the child may be disobedient, there'll be some problems. But he never expected the child was going to die. So when the child actually died, it really broke his heart. And Maharaj Chitraketu is very fortunate. He's not an ordinary person. He's born into great opulence and he has great power and in addition to that, in his past he had been a, quite an advanced devotee. So Narada and Angira have come to instruct Maharaj Chitraketu. So chapter 15 begins like this with the appearance of Narada and Angira and it appears they're somewhat disguised as abadutes, but not easy to recognize their identity. Avadutas, just like Lord Nityananda, he is avadut. Lord Rishabde was avadut. They don't belong to any particular ashram or varna. They're, they're not on the material platform, they're fully transcendental. They could be in any ashram. So, the chapter begins with Sukadeva Goswami describing Maharaj Chitraketu overcome by lamentation lay like a dead body at the side of the dead body of his son. And Narada and Angira are, have come to instruct, to try to awaken spiritual consciousness in him. Certainly it's a difficult situation. One devotee was confiding in me the other day how they regularly go to homes and perform ceremonies at the death of a relative. Customary, you know, in Hindu society, when somebody dies, they will invite the devotees to come to their home to do a kirtan 
And the devotees will do kirtan, and they will often give a, a, a talk also. They will preach from the Bhagavad Gita about the soul, the temporary nature of the body and the eternal nature of the soul. And this is the proper teaching for that uh, situation. But they said, nobody, hardly ever, anybody takes an interest. That they, although they invite the devotees to come there, although they have the program, but still they're not interested. They don't, they don't take the teaching very seriously. Mm. So, Narada and Angira, however, are very powerful and very qualified persons. And Maharaj Chitraketu is also not an ordinary soul. So we'll see how he responds to the preaching coming from, first of all, Angira. Now, Angira was the one who had given him the sweet rice in the beginning, which was the cause of the child, and Angira had warned him, this child will bring you happiness, will also be the cause of distress. So the child is named Harsha Shoka. Harsha, the jubilation, and Shoka, lamentation. So, Narada uh, Angira rather is going to speak on the platform of Gyan to awaken the transcendental knowledge. In this kind of situation, what are some good preaching strategies, what are some good examples which we would often give to help people to understand the temporary nature of the soul, uh, of the body rather, and the nature of the material existence. How would you go about it yourself? What kind of talk would you like to give? Someone Thank like... You, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, we, we <clears throat> will speak from Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, uh, you know, like uh, quoting the verses like... Uh, the soul is the temporary, I mean, uh, the soul is eternal, body is temporary, starting with the verse, Dehi Nosmin, then uh, going forward, Na Jayate, Mruyate, Va, you know, this soul is neither taken birth nor it dies, it's everlasting, you know, uh, so, you know, with this we can start our preaching, Maharaj. Okay. Yes. Second chapter describes the difference between the body and the soul. Anybody else would use a different strategy, a different section? Bhagavad Gita? Hare Krishna, Devatram Guru Maharaj. Yeah, uh, maybe we can, uh, since it's a time of sadness, we can quote the verse Dukhalayam Ashashvatam and uh, explain that how, although this world looks very nice, but it actually is a place of suffering as people are undergoing suffering at that time at the loss of a loved one. And then we can even tell them that uh, don't think this won't be coming for you. So it's, it's even uh, important for you to dedicate some amount of time or at least begin interest in spiritual life. Because like this person is gone, someday all the audience there would also be gone. So it, it's, it's not highly intelligent just to focus on the bodily activity, but also at least begin, take some interest in spiritual life because the soul moves ahead. Things like that. Mm -hmm. So speaking about the distress which is there in the material world yes, due to the temporary nature of everything in this world and also due to our attachment to the temporary objects and the temporary relationships. So any particular... Yes, Mariji? 
Hare Krishna Bharat, we can also tell them that uh, the quoting the shloka, shloka from Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, we are part and parcel of Krishna and we are eternal as a soul. And we, our eternity shows that um, if, if, if this is our place, material body is our place, we would have been living here permanently. Because it is not our place, that is why we are here for temporary for some time and then afterward we have to vacate this place because we don't belong to this place. So our, our eternal, eternal relationship is with the Supreme Lord. So we have to revive our connection. So then only we can be happy when we are connected to Him. Mm. Okay, very nice, yes. So did, did you preach like that when any of your relatives leave the world? Did you? Uh, not at that time, but generally in my uh, other classes, I keep telling them that this place is not us. That is the re reason we, we don't stay here permanent. Nobody is permanent. It means that we don't belong to this place. So there is a permanent place where we belong. So and how, we how do people respond? Permanent. How do people respond when you tell them like that? They understand that, yes, because we, I, I give them more detailed example, like if you go to travel somewhere in the hotel you are staying, then after some time, because you don't belong, you come back to your home, because that is not your place. So similarly, this is our not place. This is because that is why everybody leaves this place. Nobody is permanent here. We are here for some time. So they accept it. Yeah, it is true that we don't belong to this place. And the, but there is a place permanent where we all belong to. So that is why Krishna calls us that, uh, and we are suffering also in this material world. And Krishna, being the father, doesn't want us to suffer in this world, and he calls us that you come back to me. So we should try to hear the. Like, if you want to really be happy, we have to go back to our original place, permanent place, with our father. Then only we can be happy. So, uh, uh, people accept. Really? Yeah. They start chanting? Yeah, they, they start chanting, yes. They become devotees? Uh, I've just started saying this, but on this thought process, and yes, they accept their... They are taking it seriously. Ki, yeah, this is like, uh, yeah, we don't belong. At least they started understanding that this place is not ours. So no. uh, we should not be so much attached to this place for everything because this, we don't belong. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to say, right? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's another thing to realize it or to apply it. Once we understand, then slowly, slowly we will realize also. <laughs> this is not the place we are from. Okay. That is why we leave, our friends are leaving, our family is leaving, everybody is leaving from this place. So it makes us understand at some point of the time, this is not my name, I, I, this, I don't belong. That's why everybody is leaving from this place. Hmm. Yes, we're all leaving. Nobody can stay forever. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so here in the text, how does Angira and Narada, how does Angira go about it? What's the analogy, what examples does he give? What logic does he apply? Or does he tell to Chitraketu Maharaj to try to awaken detachment in his heart? Right. Yes? He gives the example of a sand dust particle just coming in touch and then getting separated by the waves. Ah, yes, right. Sand particles coming together. <laughs> and what's the, what's the example? They come together, but then they're separated. Yes, ma'am. It is only because of the time factor. Okay, because of the time factor, we're all separated. In, it's just a question of time before we'll be separated. The particles of sand are insignificant. In the same way, two living entities come together. It's, if it's compared to sand, but then we could certainly understand how insignificant we are. But in material life, 
because we have the bodily conception, we, uh, we have, we're very, we very much identify with our body and the bodily relationships. And we're thinking very important, and how can the person, how can I go on without that person? How could that person leave me? One, you know, one the spouse leaves the other, the partner, and how could they leave me? That we've been together for so many years, we have our children, we have our family, and they're leaving me. And so that, that feeling of separation, of course, it's going to be there, and it's very strong, natural, must be there, that can't avoid that. Just like Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, so then Arjuna went off to fight in Kurukshetra war, and a few days later Abhimanu was killed in the war. And of course Abhimanu is a very dear son of Arjuna. So one man was asking Prabhupada, he said to Prabhupada, he said, did Arjuna not lament when his son was killed in Kurukshetra? He said, Krishna had spoken Bhagavad Gita to him, telling him, you're not the body. So did Arjuna lament after his son was killed? Or did he just say, oh, it's, it's just due to time? Or did he say, oh, he's not the body? How did Arjuna respond? Did Arjuna lament? Did the Pandavas not lament when Abhimanu was killed? They lamented. They lamented, yes. So, what was but it? then they did the duty. Afterwards, they regained their blessing that understood and then they performed the next day the battle also. They took part. It's not that they were just lamenting. Yes, very good, right. And the next day Arjuna went out there and he killed Jayadratha, right? He got revenge. He thought, I'll get that Jayadratha. He was responsible for Abhimanu being killed. It was his fault and I'm going to get him. And it will be just revenge on the death of Abhimanu. And so Arjuna, by the grace of Krishna, he was able to kill Jayadratha the next day. Yes, they lamented, but as Mataji said, they went on with their duty. They didn't give up their duty. All right, very good. So, uh, we have Angira speaking to Chitraketu, describing to him the nature of the body and the soul like particles of sand, sometimes come together, sometimes separated due to the force of the waves. So the living entities have taken material bodies, sometimes come together and separated by the force of time. Prabhupada writes in the purport, we are not the body, we are spiritual beings trapped in the body. Our real self-interest lies in understanding this simple fact, then we can make further spiritual progress. Otherwise, if we remain in the bodily concept of life, our miserable material existence will continue forever. So, this is the crucial factor, of course, in self-realization, detaching ourselves from the material body. And it's a great challenge, it's a great test, because we've been conditioned for so many lifetimes to material bodies, and we're naturally very attached to the body. We identify with the body, we have a strong conditioning. So one example was the two grains of sand. What was the other example Angira gives? Another example. He doesn't stop there. He gives another example. Of seeds, Guru 
Yes, right. But the seeds, yes. What's the example? That uh, when seeds are sown in the ground, sometimes they will turn into plants and sometimes they will not. So similarly, sometimes someone will be able to beget a child by the sanction of the Supreme Lord and sometimes it won't happen. So one should not lament on these relations because they are like finally in control of the Lord. Yes, it's all in the hands of the Supreme Lord. Some people want, the, want a child very badly, they don't get. Some people don't want the child and they get. <laughs> it's not in their hands, it's up to the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada explains like that, he said, sometimes a child is born even to an impotent father and sterile mother. And sometimes a potent father and fertile mother are childless. Indeed, sometimes a child is born despite contraceptive methods and therefore the parents kill the child in the womb. So these are some of the peculiarities which take place. Oh. Angira was talking about seeds in the field. Sometimes you get a you plant so many seeds and you get a good harvest and sometimes you plant seeds and you don't get anything, nothing grows. It's not in our hands. The material nature is under the control of the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada explains in the purport, why is a child sometimes produced so that the father and mother have to kill it in the womb? Right? Sometimes this happens and we know Kali Yuga. Prabhupada says, we must conclude that our arrangement of so-called scientific knowledge cannot determine what will take place. What is enacted actually depends on the supreme will. It is by the supreme will that we are situated in certain conditions in terms of family, community and personality. It's all due to the will of the Supreme Lord. Karmana daiva netrena jantor deho papataye, right? It's all due to karma and daiva netrena, the will of the Supreme Lord. It's not only karma, but the will of the Supreme Lord. So the arrangement of the Lord is there. Sometimes we, we have our desires, but the Lord, he, had, he is the Supreme and it's ultimately it's up to His desire. So what should we do as devotees? What should be our mood? Prabhupada explains, he said, we, one should act only to develop Krishna consciousness. For, ex, for everything else, one should simply depend upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We should not create plans that will ultimately make us frustrated. This is a very important instruction Prabhupada is giving here to us. We often make plans ourselves. You know, we have a plan, I'm going to do this and then I would do that and then this and you know, a big list of what plans, what we want to do. But ultimately it's all up to the will of the Supreme Lord. The real plan should be to surrender to Krishna, to take shelter of Him and He will arrange everything else. So for everything one has to learn to depend upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Making plans, 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 that's the material world, so many plans. We should simply plan how to get out of this world. Don't simply plan for your comfort and for your retirement. <laughs> oh, to some extent we have to think about these things, but it shouldn't become the focus of our life. 
We can't be neglectful, you have, but you have to be practical. The important point is to depend on Krishna. Whatever plan we make, whatever plan man makes, Maya will destroy it. <laughs> That's the fact. We make so many plans. Prabhupada said himself, he said he was planning, he would make a lot of money and he would give it to his Guru Maharaj. But it didn't work out. Krishna had another plan. Krishna took away the business, it all failed, no money. And because he had no money, the family didn't respect him anymore. So Prabhupada thought it was time to leave home, go out from the home, go and take up full-time devotional service. Go and live in the ashram, go and do some service in the temple. And ultimately he took sannyas. And then he went to America. So Krishna had a greater plan. We should always understand the plan of the Lord is what we want to surrender to. Prabhupada was staying at home with a few children, five children. But when he left home and opened up Krishna consciousness, he had homes all over the world and many children who loved him much more than his own children. So, what was better? Should he have stayed at home just to take care of his wife and few children? Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also left his wife and elderly mother to go out and distribute Krishna consciousness to the whole world. So for, for the greater cause, one has to surrender to Krishna's plan. So, what, one of the items of surrender is to have no desire other than the desire of Krishna. So Prabhupada is making the same similar point here, that ultimately we have to depend on Krishna. Maharaj Chitraketu was planning, have, I'll have a son, and when I have a son, all my problems will be solved. But the son didn't live very long. So now it's another problem. Okay, so we, the example was given about the seeds. And then he goes on and he says, uh, Again, he's speaking in terms of Gyan, describing the nature of the material world that's a temporary situation. And he speaks about it in this manner that before the birth, the child didn't exist. And after the death, it's, he's not existing. So how can we say it's real? Before our birth, this situation wasn't there. After our death, it won't be there. Our situation now is temporary, although it's not false. So like that, this is the Vaishnava philosophy. We say the present is not false, but it is temporary. And then Prabhupada said, to, in some extent, it's like a dream. The period for dreaming exists only between, between two, between these two, between the period before you sleep and the period after you wake up. The dream does not exist before you fall asleep and it doesn't, ex ex doesn't continue to exist after we wake up. So the dream is very temporary. So the material world is like that. The period for dreaming is only between sleeping and waking up. It is false. It is false in the sense that it is, it's not permanent. So the material creation is also not permanent. It's temporary. So we don't lament about a dream. 
So this material world is also just like a dream. Just as there's the, the night dream, there is also the day dream. So in this way Angira is explaining, helping to give transcendental knowledge. He wants Chitraketu to understand the nature of this world. Then he goes on, a text, text number six, he gives another example and he talks about the child at the beach. When children go on the beach, you know, the little child goes on the beach, what does he do? Maybe he'll build a sand castle. You know, if you take your kid to the beach, they'll build a little sand castle on the beach. So, you're not going to be very interested. You know, you may encourage, oh, it's very nice, so oh, very good, you did very well. But you don't take it very seriously. But when your child goes to school, when he goes to study, then you take that very seriously. We're very concerned about our children's education. We don't worry much about what they do on the beach, what they play with the sand in the beach. But we worry about their education. We want to see, oh, they do well at school, oh, you got good grades, oh, good, you can get into a good university, oh, very nice. All right, we really care about that. It means a lot to the, the Father. So the same way the Supreme Father, we want to please the Supreme Father. The Supreme Father, he's not very much interested in us wasting our time in the material world with all of our sense gratification and enjoying the sense objects. But when we take up Krishna consciousness, when we become serious about hearing and chanting, then we actually awaken the mercy of the Father. We get the attention of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is attracted by pure devotion. He's not attracted when he sees us just wasting our life in sense gratification. So the same way, the, the father, the, the relationship between the father and the son. Maharaj Angira, he talks about how the Lord keeps everything under his control creation, maintenance and annihilation. Creation is done just like a father produces a child. Maintenance, like a government, maintains the state. And annihilation, just like a, a poison snake can kill creatures. So creation, maintenance and annihilation they're all under the control of the Supreme Lord. But because of the illusory energy, because of Maya, we think ourselves to be the cause of creation, maintenance and annihilation. We think, I, I did it, this is my child, this is my home, I'm maintaining it. And at the time, at the end, I destroyed it. I got rid of it. Useless. <laughs> Crash your car. Annihilation. Destruction. So, we should understand, and Gira is pointing out, the material nature is not independent. It's, in the, it, it's not under our control. Ultimately, it's all under the control of higher forces. So we have to understand what is our duty, Prabhupada writes. Because they have been appointed by the Lord, their duty is to consult the Lord and act accordingly. The book for consultation is Bhagavad Gita in which the Supreme Lord gives direction, right? The world is in chaos, there's so many problems, so many difficulties. How to know what to do? So the leaders have to be properly guided 
and Prabhupada says, the proper book for guidance, Bhagavad Gita. Let them hear the message of the Bhagavad Gita. This is important. If they hear the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, then they can awaken proper consciousness. They can understand the real cause behind everything. So then Angira speaks about the eternal nature of everything. He said the material elements of the body are eternal and the living entities are also eternal. The one living entity creates, injects the, the body of another living entity into the womb, into the mother. They're all eternal, all three. The father, the mother and the child, they're all eternal living entities. And the bodies are also eternal, the elements of the body are eternal. They're, sometimes they're put together in the form of a body and sometimes they're destroyed. But the elements are all eternal. Sometimes they'll enter into the Mahatattva and sometimes they'll take up in the, in, within the body of a living entity. So they're always existing, but they're just, they just undergo transformation. The elements are always existing, they just change the situations. But because of our mind, we identify with different situations. So this is the point which is brought out here, the actual cause of the suffering of the living entity is the mind. The, actually there's no suffering. The soul is eternal and the elements of the body are eternal. But we're identifying in a particular way, we're identifying ourselves as being a particular body, belonging to a particular family or a community. And we have these relationships which we have made, which are also temporary relationships. And when they're broken, then we feel the pain. So this is the illusion. And this illusion is in the mind. It's not real. It's simply in the mind. And just like in a dream, just like in a dream, you dream snakes and tigers are coming to get you. The python is going to wrap itself around you and crush you. The tiger is going to eat you. Like that, we have these dreams. And so the same way, our, our mind is the cause of all this distress in the material world. We're identifying with the body and the different situations which we're in. They're not real. So Angira has been speaking like this to Chitra Ketu. So, how does Chitra Ketu respond? What does he think? Yeah? Anybody? How do, after hearing Angira speak all these things, how does Maharaj Chitraketu take it? Uh, yeah, you heard? Is that the same? Hare Krishna, please. Please go ahead, go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, he actually uh, welcomes them, he glorifies them, and uh, he starts saying that, okay, please uh, enlighten me more. Okay, it says, he says, yeah, he's, 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 he becomes hopeful. He, came, he became hopeful hearing this. Because initially he was really, really distressed. And he thought, what's the hope? No hope. That life is meaningless. Everything is finished, it's all useless. My child is dead. 
So there was no longer any purpose in life. But after hearing all of these words from Angira, then he's, he's got some hope. This is a very important quality. We, we should be hopeful of a better life, a better level of existence. We hope we can improve our situation. How, how? With knowledge, hopeful with knowledge, the knowledge which awakens within us will change our life. So Chitraketu expresses his mood and he's questioning Narada and Angira that, who, who are you? That you, you, you seem to be covered, covering your identity, right? Have we seen this kind of thing before? Other Avadudas came, covering their identity, not revealing themselves. Some examples, who have we got? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Who? Datta Treya. Okay, was he an Avadutta? Did he disguise himself? Jad Bharat. Jad Bharat, yes. Jad Bharat. That's a good example. We know him. Maharaj, Maharaj Rishabdev. Rishabdev. Did he? Well, he, he took Vanaprast, right? He took Vanaprast, he entered the forest and then he was... Yes? Can we take the name of Sukadeva Goswami Maharaj? Yes, I think definitely Sukadeva Goswami and Jad Bharat, they're two definite examples of people who disguised themselves. They appeared to be almost like madmen. Jad Bharat, Jad, he's Jadda. He's like, yeah, he, he was pretending that he was stupid, that he didn't know anything. Yeah. Who? So Jad Bharat and Sukadeva Goswami are definitely best examples. And Maharaj Chitraketu is questioning that we, I know you, you people, you often do like this, you will cover yourself, you don't want to be recognized. We see also somebody like Madhavendra Puri, Madhavendra Puri, he was a, a sannyasi of course, but when, when the deity stole the sweet rice for him and the pujari came and gave him the sweet rice, then he knew that, oh, this is going to make me famous, that I'll get too much attention. So he was very careful to get away, to go and leave the place because he didn't want that kind of recognition. He didn't want attention. And so one thing can be quite harmful for a devotee is to get too much attention. You, you, some, you know, to be, to be famous or to get that kind of following. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Nadanam, Najanam, Nasundarim. I have no desire to accumulate wealth, nor do I want any number of followers or, or to be praised with nice poetry. These kind of things. This is not good for a devotee in Krishna consciousness. We don't want to have that kind of following. But, of course, some, for some people it just comes naturally, even though they don't want it, even though they prefer to avoid it, somehow it comes. And for Madhavendra Puri it came like that. He was such a great devotee that wherever he went and followed, and we see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how, how people also followed him. Especially when he would come to Bengal, when he came over to uh, Navadweep, and so many people were eager to see him. Okay, so Angira is recognizing, or rather uh, Chitraketu is recognizing Angira and Narada, 
and he talks about uh, brahmanas who are exalted to the position of Vaishnavas, the most dear servants of Krishna, sometimes dressed like madmen. Hmm. And, and we see Chitraketu's mood here, he said, they, they, they come just to benefit people like me, who, who, just uh, to, to help us to get, get rid of our ignorance. People like us, who, to benefit materialists like us, who are always attached to sense gratification. So you can see the mood of Maharaj Chitraketu, that he is a very humble soul, although he's a great king, he's a king of Surasena, the whole kingdom, powerful kingdom, and he's got so much opulence and ministers and wealth and everything, but he's humble. He's, he understands he's a materialist. So, he's, he's understood the purpose of these two great souls coming there. And then he goes on to speak about other great souls and he mentions the names of so many great souls. And he wonders, he says, are you this? Are you this one or that one? <laughs> he wants to try to identify who they are. You, he said, you must certainly be among them. So, <laughs> he's trying to understand the identity of these great souls who've come there and speaking so much wisdom to him. They've appeared just at that time. We see at the, the proper time how the, the, the spiritual teacher comes by the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. Just like when Maharaj Pariksit was cursed to die, and he gave up everything. At that time, Sukadeva Goswami came to speak to him, to speak Srimad Bhagavatam. They had never met before. They never met before because Maharaj Parikshit was a king, he was ruling the kingdom, and he was engaged in all kinds of business affairs, material affairs, performing the duties of the king. But after he was cursed and he'd given up the throne, and then he's ready to prepare for, for, for his death, at that time Sukadeva Goswami came. So we see that the, the pure devotees, they're the expert judge of time and circumstance. And you, in a similar way we see with Srila Prabhupada going to the West, that Lord Krishna arranged that Srila Prabhupada would go to the West just at the perfect time to inject Krishna consciousness into the Western world and to begin the Krishna consciousness movement. It's a very important point that devotees, we have to be able to take the full advantage, the proper time and circumstances. Can you think of any other examples like this? I've given Srila Prabhupada and also uh, Sukadeva Goswami's meeting with Maharaj Parikshit. Is there any other examples you can think? Perfect time and circumstance? Uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Yes, Maharaj Ji. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Can we say Dhruva Maharaj? Who? When his mother actually advised Dhruva Maharaj when his mother advised him to go to the forest, uh, not go to the forest, just actually pray to the Supreme Lord, he will fulfill what is here. He immediately accepted and he went to the forest. Okay, his, his mother had told him, you go to the forest to find God there, right? Yes, Lord. And then what happened? He actually went for the material purpose, but after seeing the Supreme Lord, his mind changed and he became a devotee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I can see the relationship with the perfect time, you know. Was that the perfect time? Like actually, he accepted the fact and he immediately uh, want to actually find a solution for that. So that exact time he went to the forest and because of his immediate attempt he got the 
special food from the Maharaj. Actually, Narada Muni tried to discourage him. Yeah. Why? Because of his age. He was very small, so it is not the right time to actually do this austerity. Yes. But he was very determined. Right, right. Yeah, Narada Muni, before he instructed him, he wanted to make sure he was properly determined. Okay. Some other example? Who? But, oh, yeah, he got the mercy of Rahugan, uh, yeah, of Jad Bharat. He got the mercy of Jad Bharat. So the two of them meeting was coincidental. He was in totally bodily, uh, bodily platform, but the, the moment when he uh, had interaction with the Jadavarta, then when, uh, because of him, then he realized what is the purpose of life. Okay, yeah. Hare Krishna Mahatma. Vidura instructing uh, Dhritarashtra. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. Vidura instructing Dhritarashtra? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's a nice one. Yeah. He had to wait for the right time. Dhritarashtra is near to death. It was quite a, quite a close... Uh, <laughs> there was only a few days. It was quite short notice. It was really a short timing. Yeah. But Vidura came. He managed to get to Dhritarashtra before he, his death came. And he was able to help Dhritarashtra to achieve a higher destination. Good, yeah. Any, anyone else? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Shukadev Goswami instructing the Parishit Maharaj. Yeah, we mentioned that. I mentioned Sukadev Goswami and I said also Srila Prabhupada. Yes. Maharaj, Katvanga. Uh, when he goes to the devatas, they tell uh, it is only a moment's time is left, he comes down back. <laughs> yeah, Maharaj Kadvanga, he got his benediction. Only a moment's time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, it, it's an interesting point that taking advantage of the proper time for the preaching. So, here we see. Yes? Can we just add on the uh, Leela between Vyasadeva and Narada? Or oh, the meeting between Vyasadeva and Narada? That Narada yes. knows when to come, right? Vyas was not satisfied, right? He was feeling not peaceful that he'd written so many books, but he didn't <laughs> feel a real peace of mind. And so then Narada comes and he told, tells him the problem. And so he instructs him, and by the grace of Narada, Vyas could compile Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, okay, so the different times certainly have some part to play in things. We know certain points in our life where we're more able to receive Krishna consciousness. So here, uh, Maharaj Chitra Ketu because of all the distress which has come in his own life, he's able to be receptive to the teachings of these two great souls who have come to his palace, Narada and Angira. And Prabhupada talks here in the purport because the Maharaj Chitraketu mentioned the names of so many great souls. And Prabhupada says, uh, all the brahmanas listed here, being devotees, travel all over the world to awaken Krishna consciousness in the hearts of such foolish materialists. So Srila Prabhupada was traveling like that to awaken Krishna consciousness in the hearts of many foolish materialists. This is the mission. That to travel, Prabhupada accepted so much austerity in his traveling. Not easy, 
really so difficult. And Prabhupada was traveling in the 70s and 60s and 70s, and it was very difficult times. Even I remember he went to Malaysia, and Malaysia you know, is a tropical country, but Prabhupada accepted the car without proper air conditioning and hotel, the, the, the different halls which he was they arranged programs in, not very adequate. We had a program, I remember one time in London, we had a program for Prabhupada. The, the devotee actually wanted to have a Bhagavat Sapta. <laughs> so Prabhupada agreed, uh, he went the first night and we had a program and then after that, then Prabhupada said, he, said, he, he told his disciple, he, there was another Swami there, a sannyasi, and Prabhupada told him, he said, you go tonight, he said, you go and do the program. He said, I, I, I can't go anymore. And he said, I went last night, you go for the other nights. <laughs> Prabhupada said, the hall was terrible, he didn't like the hall. <laughs> So Prabhupada liked, uh, you know, a nice hall, nice room, nice, should be proper arrangement for speaking. Otherwise Prabhupada didn't like to go too much. But he, he liked to have programs more in our own temples than going other places. Because programs in our own temple will be regular. But to go other places, one off, one off, one time here, one time there, then you don't get much result. But to have regular program in the temple, that's more effective. And people can come regularly and take part in here. All right, so that these sannyasis, these brahmins, they travel to give mercy. So Maharaj uh, Chitraketu glorifies them. He's really a a good person, a qualified person to surrender to these devotees. If you look at uh, the, the text number 16 in this chapter, he describes himself, he said, I am as foolish as a village animal, like a pig or dog, because I am merged in the darkness of ignorance. Therefore, please ignore, please ignite the torch of knowledge to save me. So this is really wonderful, you know, although he's a king, although he's such an exalted personality, we see his, he's really qualified to get the mercy of these saintly people like Angira and Narada. And that's what they've come to give him that special attention, to give him that mercy. And we see the, 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 the humility of Maharaj Chitraketu is really great. Just like in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Das Kaviraj also says like this, he says, Jagai madai haiti muni se papishta purushera kita haiti muni se lagishta. He said, I am more sinful than Jagai and Madhai. I am lower than a worm in stool. Anyone who utters my name, they'll lose all their pious activities. Anyone who, anyone who utters my name, they'll become sinful. Anyone who hears my name, they'll lose all their pious activities. That only the mercy of a personality like Lord Nityananda can deliver me. No one else. So, Maharaj Chitraketu is really blessed that he's able to understand the importance of taking the shelter of these great personalities. We want to get freed from material life, we have to accept the spiritual teacher. And Prabhupada in the purport here, he talks about how some people come to gurus and they have many other purposes. He, Prabhupada said, he said, one should not approach a guru just to cure some disease or re receive some miraculous benefit. But this is not the way to approach the guru. Ah. We know that it's quite common. People, they, they want to see some magic or 
they will come and they will offer their hand, they want the guru to read their hand. <laughs> so Prabhupada had his own way of dealing with these people. You know, if somebody would come and offer their hand to Prabhupada, Prabhupada would look at it and say, Oh, very bad, very bad. You better chant Hare Krishna quickly. Immediately you have to chant Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada would take every opportunity to give people Krishna consciousness. So Angira and Narada, they've come to give Krishna consciousness to Chitraketu. They've come to enlighten him. Prabhupada, in the purport, Prabhupada quotes the, the, the prayer which we often recite, Oma Jnana Timarandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. And Prabhupada writes in the purport, he said, this gives the definition of the guru. This is the definition of the guru. The guru is to open our eyes with the torch of transcendental knowledge. Right? We should feel that. One who enlightens the, 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 the disciple, saves him from rotting in ignorance, then he's a real guru. That's the actual guru who, who can open the eyes, force the, force the person to see the reality of the material world. This is a very great challenge to get people to look and see the truth. People don't want, they don't want to know the truth. You try to tell them about the nature of the material world, they don't want to hear. Maybe if Maharaj Chitraketu had been approached any other time, it wouldn't have been the same effect. Actually, Ma Angira tells Chitraketu that when I first came to you, I knew you just wanted a son. You didn't want to hear transcendental knowledge. Now the situation has changed. Now he's a little more eager to hear because he's in difficulties. He's got trouble. So he's willing, he's ready to hear. So the time and the circumstances really help a lot. So, you know, we also, when we're preaching, it's very, it's very good that, you know, when, people, when there are deaths in the home, even then we go to people's home and we preach, but very rare that they actually respond. Very rare that they're looking for enlightenment. I mean, they, they, they don't usually be, become like Chitraketu. Chitraketu, really a great devotee. Otherwise, how he could be so humble? Calling, say, describing himself like this, that I'm a dog, I'm a, I'm a pig, I'm in the darkness of ignorance. Nobody says like that. Very rare you get somebody say, I'm just a pig, I'm just a dog. So the spiritual teacher comes to enlighten, it's Narada and Nangira, they've come to enlighten Chitraketu. So going ahead, Angira speaking, he said, I approached you initially, I knew you wanted a son, so I gave you the son. He said, I'm, I'm the same person. Maybe Chitraketu didn't recognize him as being the same. And then he also introduces Narada Muni, this is Narada Muni the direct son of Lord Brahma. Angira is also direct son. They're both sons of Lord Brahma. And then Angira tells Chitraketu, you are an advanced devotee of the personality of Godhead. So to be absorbed in lamentation for the loss of something material is unsuitable for a person like you. Somebody who is advanced in spiritual, advanced devotees, 
they shouldn't be lamenting, they shouldn't hanker or lament, right? They should be on the transcendental platform. It's not the business of a devotee to lament. Rather, the business of the devotee is to be joyful and to chant the holy name and to always be in transcendental bliss. So Prabhupada describes in the purport about the business of a devotee that they should live in the association of devotees and they shouldn't, they shouldn't be greedy or anxious for any material benefit and they shouldn't lament also. So, Brahma Bhutta Prasanadma na sochati na kanchati. They don't hanker or lament for anything. This is the actual position of a devotee. Devotee is always above the modes of nature, not hankering or lamenting. So, Angira is telling Chitraketu, you know, you are a devotee, you're a great devotee. You can't lament like this. You have to get out of this illusion. So, Angira continues, he said, when I first came there, I saw that your mind was in mat absorbed in material things. So I gave you the sun. I give you that sun, give you the happiness and the cause of your lamentation. Now you're experiencing the misery. Now you know what the misery of this material world brings. Having children, having sons and daughters, having a kingdom. How long can you enjoy them for? Just like you get a nice new car. You got a nice new car, a nice combination of so many elements of the material energy and then you're driving your car and then suddenly you have a crash and the car is all damaged, all ruined. So you feel so bad and, or you get a nice house, you get a nice beautiful house and then there's a fire <laughs> and the whole house is burned and Everything is lost. So, Angira, he said, the, all of these things, all of the objects of the material world, your home, your treasury, all your relatives and children, they are all causes of fear, illusion, lamentation and distress. He said, they're like a Gandharva Nagara. Gandharva Nagara. A palace which is not real, just the illusion. So this is the material world. We're all building our temporary home, this palace of all these things in the material world. We have to be situated on the spiritual platform. We have to recognize our actual spiritual position. All of these things which we think we possess, they're just dreams. They're just thoughts in the mind, a concoction in the mind. And because of these things in the mind, this identification with all, we suffer so much, we just experience so much misery. The miseries of life, they come because of the mind. Everything material is just a concoction in the mind. Sometimes it's it's real, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. So the material world is just a creation of our mind, our mental concoction. And because of this, we suffer in the material world. All of our suffering is due to this illusion in the mind this attachment to the material world, to the temporary material energy. It's the cause of all of our problems. So we have to transcend all of these things. 
And Prabhupada goes on speaking about Lord Rishavdev. Asanapi kleshada asadeta. Nunam pramata kuru tevi karma yadindriya pritaya aprinoti nasadu manye yata atmanoyam asanapi kleshada asadeha. Prabhupada said, because of our attachment to sense gratification, because we're mad for sense gratification, we engage in so many sinful activities. Nasadu manye, that is not good. On account of all these sinful activities, you have to take another birth. So this is a problem. We're taking another birth, we're having to stay in the material world because of all of our suffering. And the sufferings come, adi bautik, adi atmik, adi daivik. And the mind is the center, and the mind creates all of these disturbances. But when we come to the platform of Brahman, then we become joyful, then we can transcend all of this. We have to come out of the material energy. So then text 26, Angira is saying to Maharaj Chitraketu, he said, consider the position of the soul. Try to understand who you are, where you have come from, where you are going when you give up this body. Try to understand in this way, then you will be able to give up your unnecessary attachment. We should be attached. We have to transfer the attachment. Instead of being attached to the temporary material, we have to become attached to the spiritual. We have to give up the attachment to the material. The attachment to the material is the cause of the greatest bondage. But that same attachment, when it's applied to the spiritual, is the cause of liberation. And the purport Prabhupada said, one must give one must give up his faith in material things and give up attachment for them. Then one will be sober and peaceful. Beautiful, huh? Give up our faith in material things. We have, we have a lot of faith in the material world. But we should transfer that faith to Krishna, to the spiritual world. We put faith we have a lot of faith in education, we have a lot of faith in physical health, a lot of faith in economics, the economy. Put our faith in Krishna, that's the best thing. Now people are putting their faith in vaccination, right? We want to take a vaccination, we have faith in our vaccine. But the best thing is have faith in Krishna, ultimately. Of course, you may need vaccine also, but <laughs> best to have faith in Krishna. So now Narada Muni is going to start speaking. Angira, he's been giving a lot of gyan. Angira has been presenting the gyan. Now Narada is going to make a change. He's going to bring in a bit more, a bit more bhakti. And he, he tells... The king, he said, uh, I will give you a mantra which is most auspicious. After accepting it from me, in seven days, in seven nights, you will be able to see the Lord face to face. Oh, wouldn't we all like that? If we were given a mantra and it just takes seven days, Seven nights, you'll be able to see the Lord. Oh, this is so wonderful. And he says, in the past, Lord Shiva and other demigods took shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Sankarshan. Thus they immediately got free from the illusion of duality and achieved unequaled and un 
unprecedented glories in spiritual life, you will very soon attain that very same position. So this is great, very encouraging words from Narada Muni. The Maharaj Chitraketu must really be a alerted hearing Narada Muni speak like this. Oh, he's going to give a special mantra and only seven days, seven nights rather, huh? Very, must be very powerful. Actually chanting Hare Krishna, you just need to chant one time, but you have to chant perfectly without offense. Even one time chanting the holy name can destroy unlimited amounts of sin. Here, seven nights, just like Sukadeva Goswami, Maharaj Parikshit, seven days, Sukadeva Goswami is speaking Srimad Bhagavatam. So, the mantra is going to be given. Okay, we'll go, ahead, we'll go ahead into the next chapter because it's a big chapter and we'll just try to cover a little bit more of this chapter 16 which describes about Queen Ch Chitraketu meeting the Supreme Lord. But before he meets the Supreme Lord, Angira and Narada are not finished their preaching. Narada's got a special strategy to try to really pull in Maharaj Chitraketu, to really get him to have full faith in the devotional line and in, in the process of what he's doing. Because he's been through a heavy thing, he's lost that one son, he wanted so badly the son, and now he's lost it. So Narada Muni wants to make sure that Chitraketu is really convinced about what happened and he's really understood everything properly. So, what's Narada's special strategy? What's he going to do, Parmananda? Maharaj is going to bring back the child, Arsha Soka, back to life. Yes. Wow. You know. Ma, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says in his commentary, he said, Narada Muni entered into that body of the child and brought him back to life to speak, to enlighten Maharaj Chitraketu and all the other people there, the relatives, let them all see what, let them all know what has actually happened. And so, very wonderful thing, eh? very powerful preaching. If you could do like that every time, you know, you could really make devotees. <laughs> if we had somebody who could do that, you go there with somebody died and you bring them back to life and you tell them, you know, you're not my father, you're not my mother, <laughs> I'm going. Very powerful strategy, very powerful preaching. Just like Prabhupada, Prabhupada also had powerful strategy. He brought dancing white elephants to India. When he was beginning preaching in India, he brought his dancing white elephants. <laughs> Any other preaching strategies you know of? Anybody else? Any, any other examples about these special strategies which people use for preaching? Anybody? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandot Pranam. Maharaj, when, uh, uh, when people call uh, uh, my children for uh, birthday parties, you know, so that's the biggest good opportunity. Uh, my children, they go and then they say, you know, we will not eat this cake because this is uh, with egg, we are Vaishnava. So then definitely they ask, what is Vaishnava? And that's the time, you know, we get opportunity to enlighten them. Oh. And uh, always my children will go with the Bhagavad Gita book or Krishna book yeah. for a gift. Wonderful, wonderful. What, what age are your children? Uh, my youngest son is now going to uh, complete his 12th and elder one is ready for initiation, uh, Maharaj. He is aspiring to Radhanath Swami Maharaj. Okay. Very... Uh, right from beginning in the schools, Maharaj, whenever they will uh, pass out from one... Uh, standard and they are going to the another class, 
I'm very sure that the teacher is going to call because they will say, don't put, you know, they will tell their friends, don't put hand in my tiffin. You all are eating onion garlic, non-veg. I am Vaishnava. So the parent, mother will call and ask, what is Vaishnava? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then uh, definitely we'll get an opportunity to uh, pass on Krishna consciousness to them. Okay, very interesting. Very good strategies for preaching. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, there are some devotees that wherever they go, they always take prasadam with them. They always bring prasadam. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, when my eldest son, I was uh, uh, going to drop him to US, uh, we happened to travel by uh, Emirates. So I always carry little dry prasad and Prabhupada's small, small books. So we will see to it all that 18, 19 hours is getting uh, utilized properly. So first we will give the taste of prasad. Then we'll keep telling them small, small things, you know, in the story way. Who is this? Who are you giving the prasad to? Uh, to the air hostess or if I find anybody uh, who is... Uh, by the time, uh, by three, four hours, we'll become definitely friendly with somebody or the other due to uh, small children or young children or some young people. So we will talk and then uh, we will pass little prasad. Uh, we will give small Prabhupada's book. Okay. Very nice. Yeah, when there's a, where there's a will, there's a way. If, because you have a strong desire to want to preach and give Krishna consciousness, so certainly you'll find a way to do it. It's very nice. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh-huh. Maharaj, right now I'm in US to attend my daughter's uh, my granddaughter, who is now, she's in a hospital, she's a preterm baby. So there's a nice incident to share with you, Maharaj, because uh, uh, my son-in-law is the disciple of uh, uh, Vaisheshka Prabhu. So after uh, my granddaughter's birth, the, the way they are taking care in hospital is amazing. So um, wife of uh, Vaisheshka Prabhu, uh, her name is uh, Nirakula Mataji, she made cookies, 100-150 cookies, and she sent from Seattle to the hospital staffs, so thanking each and every one for taking care of the new devotee. So everyone got inspired with her action, how she distributed the love of Lord. Oh, wonderful. 150 cookies. Yes, Maharaj. Wow, not... She cooked and she, with thanking Carl, uh, God, she sent to the hospital for taking care of his little angel. Oh. And gave to all the doctors and nurses. Yes, yes, Maharaj. All the, all, all the staff got the mercy. Mm. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Now, due to pandemic, uh, many of uh, people, when we come to know that they are hospitalized and uh, they are disturbed, so our Bhakti Riksha Matajis, if it is female, so they will call up and read. Bhagavad Gita shlokas for them, talk to them. Oh, wonderful. Call up and read the Bhagavad Gita shlokas to them. That's very nice preaching. Mm. <laughs> so you ladies are really doing very nice. You're really very... Uh, eager. Bless us, Maharaj. Bless us. We want to do more. Yes, really. Krishna's showering his blessings on you giving you good, good intelligence to think how to preach and how to give Krishna consciousness out. Very, very nice. What about the men? Yes, Prabhuji. Even my Prabhu is also, you know, initiated uh, and even he takes uh, part in uh, preaching. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because of this pandemic, it opened a lot of avenues for preaching. Oh. And uh, those, you know, uh, you know, the people used to be, you know, pretend as atheists. Now, you know, the, you know, we 
can uh, convince them, um, at least uh, we can preach to them. Hmm? So, I mean, uh, there is some superior force, you know, which is controlling everything. Then why you are so scared of a little tiny unseen uh, coronavirus? And also it has got, you know, like many classes have started online classes and, you know, trying to connect the devotees in their own uh, uh, language or in their own uh, culture, you know, where, uh, you know, devotees are working very hard to give them Krishna consciousness, which is very easily palatable for them. One such thing is like in Kannada, like there are so many saintly persons, like how we have Nartam Das Thakur and all our great Acharyas who uh, literally, you know, gave Krishna conscious in, in form of songs. And in Karnataka also there are a few uh, Dasas like Purandara Dasa, Kanaka Dasa. So many people are interested in uh, singing those, uh, uh, they call it as Dasarapada. So our devotees are innovatively, uh, you know, uh, singing that songs. Of course, that Purandara Dasa, he composed only Krishna songs. So they are injecting Krishna consciousness through those songs and uh, injecting Prabhupada philosophy. Oh, wonderful. The devotees can sing their local songs, huh? In yes, Ka yes, Maharaj. In Kannada language. Yeah. Mm, very nice. Where, where is that? In, in Bangalore, is it? All over Karnataka, Maharaj. All over Karnataka. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, certainly, where there's a will, there's a way, and this COVID, although lockdown is coming, it didn't stop the preaching. In some ways, the preaching has become more. We've done more preaching. This, this Karuna is really, you know, it is Krishna's Karuna. It's not Karuna for us. <laughs> yes, Karuna, yes, right, it's mercy, right, definitely. And I think uh, when, if it gets over, then we'll, we'll, we will miss it. <laughs> we'll miss it. We'll think like, we used to have so much nice time during the corona. Yeah. Certainly I'm, I'm having a good time, this corona, keeping me more busy than I've ever been. And I don't have to travel so much. That's also wonderful. I, I really didn't like traveling so much. <laughs> It's nice to be away from the airports after spending so many days and hours and things traveling through airports. It's very nice to just be in one place. Unfortunately, with the help of technology, we can keep in touch with so many devotees all around the world. So yes, we try to take advantage. So Narada Muni, he's a great yogi. He could bring the boy back to life. And what does the boy have to say when he comes back to life, Paramananda? Well, he said, I, I don't remember which father or mother you are. I have so many. <laughs> yeah, right. A little bit, how would you feel, you know, your son, you lose your son and he comes back and said, which father are you, you know? <laughs> Quite a devastating blow, you know, to be for the parents to hear this. First of all, they would be so jubilant to see the child come back to life. But when the child actually speaks to them and says, I don't know who you are, what you're talking about. Because Narada had inquired from him, Narada is t asking him, said, why are you leaving here? He said, you're, all your friends and relatives are here. You have all the throne here, the opulence is all here, it's waiting for you. Why are you going? But <laughs> the, 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 the young boy says, mm, according to the results of my activities, I've already passed my time here, now it's time to go. No one, he says, no one is actually my father and mother. How can I accept these two people as my parents? No one is my father and mother. How could that be? No one is my father and mother. Yeah, Maharaji, can you under, why would, why would he say like that? No one is my father and mother.
How could he say he was not their son? Srila Prabhupada answers in the purport, he said, actually, however, he was not their son. The living entity is the son of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And because, because he wants to enjoy the material world, the Supreme Lord gives him a chance to enter various bodies. So this is why we got a material body, because we wanted to enjoy. We came here to enjoy separate from Krishna. So it was our desire. But the Lord is actually the Father. We're all, he is a aham bijapradapita. He's the Father of all living entities. So we've forgotten that relationship. So every living entity carries these different identities with them and because of these different identities we suffer so much. Narada gives example, he said, material world advances like a river that carries the living entities away. We come together for some time in the river Objects may f come together, then they're separated. They never come together again. So the same way, material world. We come together in a family or in a company, in a situation, and then just for some time, then we're separated. There's no permanent connection. None of us are permanently connected. Sometimes the husband and wife, they want to be together next life also. We want to be husband and wife in the next life also. That John Lennon came with his wife Yoko Ono and they asked Prabhupada, we want to be husband and wife in the next life also. Prabhupada told them, I cannot give such a stupid blessing. <laughs> That's not the purpose of the spiritual master. So Prabhupada explains, Chitra Ketu was lamenting for his son who was now dead, but he could have considered the situation otherwise, right? What, what, what was the alternative? He was lamenting his son is dead, but Prabhupada's giving up, he said he could have considered it another way he could have considered that his son was anybody? Yes, his enemy. Right, his enemy. We could have considered this son was my enemy. Right, he was my enemy in my last life, and now by becoming my son, he's just come to give me pain and misery. Prabhupada told like that to one man, there was this one man, he came to Prabhupada, his son was born with the Down syndrome. You know Down syndrome, the, you know this, uh, what is the, the brain is not properly developed. So the man came to Prabhupada and he asked Prabhupada, he said, why my son is like this? And Prabhupada told him, he said, you know, in your last life, you had taken money from this son. This son of yours in his last life, he was a business acquaintance and you took money from him and you did not pay him back. So you're, this, this, fr this man who was your business friend in the last life, you owed him money because you did not pay him back the money. He came as your son in this condition with the, with the Down, Down syndrome, uh, the brain is uh, all gone, you know, he's, he cannot, cannot speak, he cannot, not, not normal person. So Prabhupada told him, he said, it was you 
you didn't pay back the money to him. So he came to give you pain. So Prabhupada is saying the same thing in this purport. He's saying, Maharaj Chitraketu could have thought like that. He should think like that. Why is he thinking, he's lamenting that my son has left me? He could also think that that son was my enemy and he just came in my family just to cause me pain, to give me suffering. He came and he left and he knows he's giving me pain. So he could think like that. That's another way of looking at the situation. So if the son was your enemy, you'd be glad that he'd gone, glad that he's dead. Oh, <laughs> good, he's gone. No more trouble. He gave me so much trouble. And then Narada gives another example. He talks about gold, different commodities. Or it could also be animals that just like you have jewelry and or some gold and then you, you give it to somebody else or you sell it. You sell it. It's not yours anymore. Or you have maybe you have some cows and you sell the cows. They're not your cows anymore. You don't own them anymore. And so it's like that. The sun comes for some time. You can't say he's your son. He came from another place. He stays with you for some time. Then he goes some other place. Prabhupada talks about the money. He said, the money belongs neither to one person or to the other person. Money is always money. But in different situations, it can be used as an enemy or as a friend. Right? You think, my money, that's my money. But somebody, you, get, you give the money to somebody else, the man gets the money and he uses it for himself. So the same way with the, the sun. The sun comes, is with you for some time, then it goes with somebody else. Prabhupada says, Prakrite kriyamanani, right? Material nature, loss of nature, force him to go to different fathers and mothers. Different fathers, different mothers. Just like consumer commodities purchased and sold. The so-called relationship, father and son, is an arrangement of nature, has no meaning, and therefore it's illusion. So the same living entity, the same child, it's the illusion, we're thinking my child. He wasn't your child before he was born, and after he dies, he's not your child. Before he was born, he was some other place, and after he's dead, he goes another place. Prabhupada quotes Bengali saying, Janami Janabi Sabi Pita Matapai Krishna Guru Nahimili Bajahariai. Everybody has got a mother and father, even the worms and the birds and the jackals. Here in Mayapur, outside, you can hear the jackals crying. They have their mother and father. Every living entity has a mother and father. That's not so important. The important thing is to get the spiritual teacher in Krishna. The difficulty is to get a bona fide teacher in Krishna. So the duty of a human being is to get in touch with Krishna's representative, the bona fide teacher. And under the guidance of the bona fide teacher, then we can come to Krishna. Okay, so Narada Muni is really preaching powerfully, wonderful. Th oh, th this is a child actually, this is a boy speaking like this, not Narada Muni. But Narada Muni speaking through the child. It's a child speaking. People like to hear philosophy from children. 
It's very powerful. If you get children to speak, just like Madhiji was saying that her children going to school, little children, when they speak like that, then it's very powerful. It really impresses people. Okay, so who is the actual proprietor? Who is the owner? Who is the mother? Who is the father? <laughs> it can, you know, it's not eternal. That's the point. Krishna is the real father. Not, we, we may think, I'm the father, I fathered the body. No, it's all done by Krishna ultimately. We have to see the hand of Krishna. Okay? So Narada Muni, uh, the boy is speaking like this about the nature of the living entity and how the living entity is one with the Lord but at the same time different from the Lord. The Lord is the greatest and the living entity is the smallest. All right? Amsha and Vibhinamsha. The Lord is very great, we're very small, we're insignificant. So the child speaks like this and hearing the child speak, then everybody is really convinced and they can understand, you know, that, okay, you know, after he's spoken like this, then the child lays down again. Nobody should be affected by lamentation. The, 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 there's no point in lamenting. They've seen the child come back to life and he's speaking and he's enlightening them with spiritual knowledge. So they're all satisfied. And he was encouraging them, you have to be neutral. Neutral, meaning not to get disturbed. You shouldn't be personally affected. Neutral doesn't mean you don't do anything, but means you don't get disturbed by the happenings, the workings of the material energy. People dying or people taking birth, you know, we just understand this is the nature of the material world, that these things happen. So we have to do our duty and depend on Krishna for the results. That's the important point. So Sukadeva Goswami then begins speaking. After the son, after the boy had spoken, everybody was astonished and Maharaj Chitraketu and all the other relatives, they all gave up their affection for the dead child and they stopped their lamenting. And the women who had given poison to the child, they had all lost their luster. So everybody could, they could their guilt was very apparent because they'd lost the luster because of their guilt of offence. When somebody is very guilt, very offensive, when they do something very sinful, then you can see it in their face. So these women were very uh, affected hearing the child speak and they admitted their guilt and they, took, they, they were instructed by the brahmanas to go to the Yamuna and bathe there and to atone. They have to do atonement for their sin. And very interesting in the purport there, where it talks about these women, how they had to atone for killing the child. He said in the same way, he said, so many women today kill their children in the womb. And Prabhupada talks about how there's so much abortion everywhere. He said, in the times of Maharaj Chitraketu, it was very rare that a child would be killed. But today, at this time, it's very common that children are killed in the womb. And even sometimes after they come out of the womb, they're killed. So Prabhupada talks how, he said, these women in the time of Maharaj Chitraketu, who had given poison, they all went to do atonement. He said, today, people do abortion, they never do, they never do atonement. They never think about atoning for their sins. It's so common. You, you, even we have people coming to Krishna consciousness, they've had many abortions. And of course, they say, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. 
Many people say like that. I didn't know at the time. We didn't know. I just, we just did it. I thought everybody did it. But everybody does it. They don't want the child. They just go for the abortion. It's very sinful. So what is the atonement? The actual, Prabhupada explains the atonement is they should become very serious about Krishna consciousness. They should chant the holy name very seriously and they should take to the Krishna conscious process very strictly and they should never again do such a sin. That's very important. So that point is made and so they go for atonement and Maharaj Chitraketu also goes to the Yamuna and bathes and they come back and then Narada is ready, he's going to give the mantra to Maharaj Chitraketu. So tomorrow, next class will begin where Narada Muni gives the mantra to Maharaj Chitraketu. So we'll stop here. Are there any questions? Any comments? Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful session. Maharaj, one question. Like in the beginning of the class, like uh, when uh, uh, Narad Muni entered the body of uh, Harsha Shoka, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned that, you know, now also like Narad Muni should do, uh, he should enter the people who, are, who left their body. But in this case, uh, uh, he was a small, he was a baby in Maharaj, you know, he didn't have so much uh, uh, attachment to their parents, like Chitra Ketu and, uh, uh, and uh, his mother. But like, you know, like we have passed, you know, so many years with our parents. Uh, you know, if that thing happens, how can we do that, Maharaj? Uh. <laughs> like I, I lost my par my ma my parents when I was almost like uh, uh, thirty five years. So, your point is that you feel more attachment. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you you said you lost your parents. So they were elder, older people. That is expected, that the elders are going to depart. That's to be expected. But it's more unexpected when the child departs. But for the elders to depart, that's, that's natural, that's there. Everybody, we see that, the elders depart, our mothers and First the grandparents depart, and then the mother and father, and then it's our turn. <laughs> We're thinking like that. We're waiting in line. We're waiting to go. When we're going to go, we don't know. So it's more difficult in the case of the young child. And that was one of the arguments, right, Queen Krita Dut? duty, they said, what kind of arrangement is this, that the child will go while well, we're still alive? Why didn't they take us first? We're older. We should have died before the child. So older people, yeah, older people, they will die. We have to expect that. I heard that now, because in India they have this uh, vaccine now, so they want to give the vaccine to all the older people. Because the older people are the ones who are more susceptible to the disease, and if they get it, they're more likely to leave the body. And so they're saying a the, the priority is to give the vaccine for the old people. I don't know. Other places it's different. I heard like in some countries, they, they don't give it to the old people, they give it to the working people. Because they're working. So we have to keep them healthy so they can keep working. 
Older people, let them die. <laughs> let them die. They're going to die anyway soon. So, so different thinking is there about whose life is more important, what kind of life should be safe, whose life should be saved first. Just like when the Titanic went down, the Titanic went down so that there was only one little boat. And so they put some young children, there were some young girls or something who were on the ship, and they put them into the boat and they put a few ladies also in the boat. And everybody else just went down on the, with the boat, they just went down. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm. Okay. So, maybe we'll stop here tonight. And next class we'll, we'll go on from this point where Narada Muni is giving the mantra to Chitraketu. We'll hear about the mantra and we'll hear how Chitraketu is able to meet Lord Sankarshan. Okay. So, yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, do you have a question? Uh, it's just uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. I Hare. was just wondering, like uh, Chitraketu, who was such a powerful king and so influential, uh, how is that in his uh, court? There were no one who could actually give them I mean, the transcendental understanding. He lived for such a long time. He got married to so many millions of queens. How is that? There was no such arrangement with Chitraketu before uh, Narada and Gira could actually come into his palace. This was something which was really, uh, I was really wondering what could have been the kind of a kingdom that he was ruling in that place. Well, it appears, it, it appears that he did have some primary education because he knew the names of so many great souls. And he knew also the greatness of a Vaishnava, and he knew also about, uh, well, he, he understood his own ignorance. He was quick to, to recognize his own ignorance in his lamentation. I think there must have been quite a bit of education there on his part that he'd already, and they said, they said also, uh, and Gira said that you're an advanced devotee. Mm. So how is it he had become an advanced devotee? He must have had already contact and he'd learned things. But still, he, he had that attachment as Angira also said, he said, when I came there the first time, he understood the mind of Maharaj Chitraketu, how much attached he was to having a son that that was the, the main thing in his mind. That while he was respectful to Angira and to Narada, that his purpose was material. He didn't know how to take really advantage of them until his son actually died. I understand, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for enlightening in that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Prabhu, so thank you very much. We'll continue again on uh, Monday evening. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.